The year is 2017. The Nintendo Switch was revealed only a few months prior, and Nintendo held a special presentation event in January to show off some upcoming games for the system, like Super Mario Odyssey, Splatoon 2, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and the subject of today's video, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. At the time, I wasn't really a big Xenoblade fan. The most I knew was Shulk in Smash 4, and listened to the music of Gar Plane, and shouting, I'm really feeling it! Yeah, I was one of those people. As well as being amazed by the mechs in the world of Xenoblade X, which I kind of forgot came out so I never bought it, I was very excited when Xenoblade 2 was announced because Xenoblade has always been a series I wanted to get into. With each trailer and day passing by, on December 1st, 2017, the game was released, and I got it a few days after for my birthday, and my life was changed forever. I fell in love with Xenoblade 2 to its fantastic cast of characters, breathtaking world, and an unforgettable soundtrack. Despite its pauses and incredible highs, it has some very low lows. Five years have passed since Xenoblade 2 was released, and its impact can be seen since then. Today, I want to look back on this amazing game, despite its flaws, and show why it captivated me and many others back in 2017, and even now, in 2022. This is... Before I go into my deep dive about Xenoblade 2, I want to give a warning that this video will contain spoilers for the three mainline Xenoblade games. If you haven't played these games, or only have played one or two of them, what are you doing here? Go out and play these incredible games. These games have some of the best moments in gaming, and I wouldn't want to ruin that for anyone. But for those who are still here, I'll assume you've completed all three games, or you just don't care about spoilers. But enough rambling, it's time to dive in. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 started playing around July 2014, nearing the end of Xenoblade X's development, which was released in 2015. Xenoblade 2 was more akin to the first Xenoblade game on the Wii, which was more story-focused compared to Xenoblade X's more gameplay and exploration-focused approach. Xenoblade 2's release window of 2017 was also because the team at Monolith wanted the game to be released early in the Nintendo Switch's life cycle. This decision would end up being a double-edged sword for Monolith later on. One of the team's main goals with Xenoblade 2 was to make the characters more expressive compared to the previous games, like Xenoblade 1's stiff expressions due to the limitations of the Wii's hardware, and Xenoblade X's more doll-like characters with only a set amount of expressions for specific cutscenes. To accomplish this goal, Monolith hired Masasugu Saito, a freelance character designer for anime, to give the game an anime-like art style, and to give the characters more expression. The main antagonist group, Torna, was done by famed character designer Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts, Tetsuya Nomura. Remember when I said the 2017 release window was a double-edged sword? Well, Monolith's dev team was sliced in half and pulled the Nintendo to work on a small indie game you might know of called Breath of the Wild, due to Monolith's world experience from developing Xenoblade X. So the remaining half of Monolith worked on the game, still pushing toward that 2017 release. What mad lads. This led to things being left on the cutting room floor, like New Game Plus, and most notably, a story scenario that will take place between chapters 7 and 8 that will eventually become Torna, the Golden Country that was released 9 months later. Monolith's hard work would pay off when Xenoblade 2 was released to positive reviews from critics and fans alike. Alright, it's quite hard to talk about Xenoblade 2 without mentioning the various controversies related to it during the pre-release period of the game. First, let's talk about the elf in the room, shall we? The new art style headed by Saito would cause some controversy since his initial reveal in the Nintendo Switch presentation. Most complaints were just trashing the various character designs, including the very drawn out debate that has come up repeatedly after 5 years, which is the argument of over sexualization within the game, most notably within the female characters. Let's get this out of the way. Does Xenoblade 2 have sexualization? Yes. But the source of that sexualization, personally, isn't with the designs, but with the portrayal of the characters in various scenes throughout the game. I just don't think just having big breasts inherently make things over sexualized, but what do I know? I personally recommend Six's video on Xenoblade 2's character design, as he has a whole section dedicated to this with months of collected data and could probably explain this a whole lot better than I could. One last controversy that the game faced was the... Take this. Voice acting. Either trailer's English voice acting was not the greatest, which was a notable downgrade from the original Xenoblade's incredible dub. They got Nintendo of Europe to localize the game again just like the first, so why the quality drop? The answer to that question is a good old race with time. There was a different voice director this time, and the voice talent barely had any direction or context with their lines, which led to lines like... <laughs> this. 
during the earlier chapters. But after many months of the constant discourse of the designs and the voice acting, it all culminated when Xenoblade 2 released on December 1st, 2017. The presentation of Xenoblade 2 holds up quite well after five years since its release. With vibrant colors for each location to visit and an incredible attention to detail throughout the game. Each playable character has their own unique animations for jumping, swimming, and even attacking with the various blade weapon types. It's so cool seeing Zeke and Nia use the same type of weapon but still have their own flair to it via their own unique animations. Xenoblade 2 still has the drawback of it being Monolith's first game on the system that were fixed in the following releases over the years, a few notable being the slow transition to the main menu for the game, the lack of multiple save files, making different switch profiles doesn't count, textures being unloaded when you skip travel to another location, and the infamous tutorials. The cutscene direction is top notch, with the use of motion capture in the major cutscenes. A decision started with Xenoblade X on the Wii U, as a significant step up from the impressive yet limited keyframing technique from the first game, allowing Monolith's already incredible cinematography to soar to even greater heights, many scenes composed with so many dynamic shots and angles. This direction and use of mocap continued on to future Xenoblade projects after 2's release. Xenoblade 2's anime-esque art style was a massive shift for the series, from the gritty and realistic art style used in the previous games to the art style headed by Masasugu Saito, which led to Monolith accomplishing their goals for the characters, which was more expression. The main cast has such a wider range of expressions during cutscenes, making them feel alive in ways the first game didn't before a definitive edition, and X's mostly lack thereof. While on the topic of the art style, let's talk about character designs. If you search up bad character designs on Google, Xenoblade 2's designs will pop up even after 5 years. Despite what the internet may say, Xenoblade 2 has some incredible character designs for the main cast. Almost every playable party member, besides Rex and a few other notable exceptions, have some cloth that blows in the wind, like Pyramiphus' cloak, Poppy's cape, and Zeke's coat. This was done so the characters can express the atmosphere of the world around them. Those who didn't have a cape were given to this aspect to other parts of their body, like their hair. Each of the main cast represent either a nation, an occupation, or their role in the story within their character designs. For example, Rex, with the amount of no-trip jokes lambasted him nearly every few months, his design is quite good within the context of the game. Yeah, sure, the multiple worlds can be a little bit silly, but his outfit does a really good job representing what he does, living as a salvager. Nia represents the Gormati with the distinctive cat ears, Morag is down with a militaristic attire, not only to represent more ordained, but to also show a position within the nation as a special inquisitor. Zeke wearing a thick coat is not only to look cool, but to also represent Tantal and his frigid climates, hence the need of the coat. Saito did multiple interviews talking about the various details he put into the designs prior to launch. He talks about Rex and Nia being small, but puts emphasis on the various aspects of the characters to make their movements look bigger, like the size of Rex's arms and legs, and Nia's baggy clothing and big boots. My favorite aspect that came from these interviews has to be when he's talking about Pyra's design, with him designing her with a protective presence for Rex, while also having a sense of incompleteness due to being the reflection of her alter ego, Mifra, with horizontal asymmetrical lines on the glowing parts of her body, and why the part of her back is open with her cloak. These aspects of the designs give them identity and help them stand out from the crowd, and Xenobay 2 wouldn't be the same without them. Each Xenoblade game has a unique aspect to them that differentiates them from each entry of the series. Xenoblade 1 has divisions in the Monado, Xenoblade X has scales in Overdrive, Xenoblade 3 has Ouroboros, and Xenoblade 2 has the Blades. Everything about the game depends on the Blades, from combat to exploring the world, for better or worse. To acquire a Blade, you must summon him for a Core Crystal, which can be found in the world or after defeating an enemy. What blade you get from the crystal is complete random chance and is divided into one of 8 elements and 7 different weapon types, along with 3 roles with those roles being attacker, healer, and tank. If this system sounds like a gacha system in many free anime mobile games, then you'd be right. The blade summoning system works exactly like a gacha system, but without the predatory microtransactions. Each blade comes with an infinity chart, which is much different from the ones from Xenoblade 1, and are divided up into 3 sections. The far left is upgrades to the blade specials, the middle portion are the blade's battle skills, attributes that make the blades unique in combat, like Chrisette's Gathering Sparks, which increases damage dealt every time you pick up an HP potion, or Orb Master, which allows you to get an orb by executing a special. The final section of the Infinity Chart on the far right are the field skills, <laughs> but 
<laughs> we'll get to that one in a little bit. You unlock parts of the affinity chart by using the blade in battle, or by using pouch items to raise trust. Trust boosts the auto attack damage of blades within combat, and will also unlock nodes on the affinity chart. Trust goes from E to S+, plus, with going from S to S+, plus being quite tedious, as S rank is divided up into 10 levels before reaching S+, plus, which will require a lot of material farming to create those elusive love sources. Blades also have some customization to them, via core crystals and ox cores, giving them more effects within battle like extra stats or bonus effects like a higher crit rate. Blades are separated into two groups, common blades and rare blades. Common blades are generic blades that will get the job done for whatever you need, whether that need is for combat or to complete a merc mission. Rare blades are all common blades can do, but also have unique abilities and a unique design. Each design for the rare blades was done by illustrators within the anime, manga, and video game industry, like Cosmos, a guest character from the Xenosaga series who was designed by Kunihiko Tanaka character designer for Xenogears and Xenosaga Episode 1. Some say the various art styles on the rare blades make them clash with one another, but these designs not only help them be unique in their own right, but also give off the otherworldly feeling that the blades are supposed to inhabit. Some of my favorite designs in rare blades are Crescent with her roller skates and a whole bunch of fireworks, Azami with her whole puppet aesthetic, seriously it's so fucking cool, Shiba who costs a lot to get, but she's in a goddamn bathtub drinking tea. And her and the bathtub are being treated as a collective is a whole nother level of silly I just love. Cassandra with her Chris Fox aesthetic, she's also really cute. Praxis and Theory are also really good highlights. And lastly, Finch. Come on, look at her. You can't possibly hate Finch. Rare Blades also have their own heart to hearts, giving them all characters and have some very funny interactions with the main party. Oh, wait, I get it. I know what this is about. You're the catastrophically untidy type, aren't you? Uh, I... <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. There is one more unique type of blade, and that is the artificial blade, Poppy. Poppy has three forms that represents the various stages of a person's life. Alpha represents her as a child, Poppy QT is a teenage stage, and lastly, Poppy Cutie Pie represents the stage of an adult. Poppy can be any of the three roles in any of those three forms. Poppy doesn't have ox cores, but instead, she has Poppy Swap that allows you to build Poppy the way you want. Granted, it's going to take you a while to make her the ultimate killing machine due to needing the necessary parts and her currency, Ether Crystals. Ether Crystals and Poppy parts can be found within the minigame, Tiger Tiger. Tiger Tiger is an alright minigame for the first few times until you feel like you have to sell your soul. Luckily, you can find parts scattered throughout the world and specific vendors selling you Poppy parts and crystals in New Game Plus. But finally setting up a poppy build after hours of grinding and seeing her shred bosses is always so satisfying. The gacha system has some positives, despite the frustration it can cause for various aspects of the game. And that positive aspect is, it allows a unique playthrough for everyone who plays Xenoblade 2. You can be playing with Godfrey or Finch in one playthrough, and your buddy can luck out and get Cosmos in Chapter 3. It helps with the replayability for this game, a unique strength Xenoblade 2 has compared to other entries in the series. Like its predecessors, the world of Xenoblade 2 has many vast and beautiful locations to roam around. Following the first game, where the player roams on the bodies of two titans, the Bionis and the Mechanis, in the sequel, the player roams on the bodies of multiple titans that swim within the Cloud Sea and orbit the mysterious world tree. The various titans that swim through the Cloud Sea have their own flair to them. For example, Gormont has its lush forests and lakes and grassy plains, to other titans like Araya, with its expansive main area with one of the most Beautiful locations I've seen in a video game, with Siphonia trees illuminating the Titan's stomach with Fonza Mima in the distance. Another example is Moradain, with its industrialized look, with the various pipes, factories, and power plants, and even Alba Kavanich, representing the nation's technological prowess that contrasts the arid environment, which shows Ardain's need to colonize. Another highlight to me is Lotheria. Lotheria is made of multiple Titans clumped together, which can provide some of the most beautiful vistas in the game. From the cloudways to the beautiful aurora borealis at night, Letheria has it all. Even the cloud sea comes into play, with certain areas being available depending on the depth of the tide. In all rest, each titan has a development level, which can be increased by buying and selling items from various shops. Increasing dev level gives you access to more items within that shop. You can also raise development level by going on merc missions that are essentially the builders from Clash of Clans, but you can't spend money to speed up the process. 
Merc missions also benefit the Blaze you send out on them, with upgrades to their affinity charts instead of doing them manually. But that's enough about Merc missions for now, before I awaken out ancient evil- OH GOD! If you buy enough items, or complete a specific Merc mission, you get access to the shop's deed. Deeds give you bonuses like increased XP gains from battles, to increased movement speed. I can go on and on about these locales with their respective nations and histories, but there's always one roadblock that gets in my way of every playthrough exploring these vast titans. And those are field skills. Field skills as a concept isn't bad as it encourages swapping of various blades outside of battling, but it gets tedious to do this check every time you want to do a high jump, a dive, or any other field skill check. Unfortunately, due to how the blade system is, you can get gated out of a field skill check due to gacha, which could also lead to frustration for the system. It wouldn't be hard to incorporate one-time field skill checks, with many of them existing throughout the game, most notably within the story. Field skills slightly dull the magic of exploration, like finding a secret area, or the excitement of a side quest. But speaking of side quests, the side quests in Xenoblade 2 are quite good, ranging from the typical fetch quest to exploring new areas of the Titans. Xenoblade 2 has it all, with the main highlight being the blade quests. The blade quests are the best side content the game has to offer, as each blade quest fleshes out the rare blades with their own unique voice cutscenes, with some being on the range of fan service, funny, and eh. My favorites has to be Sheba's, where you grind up a million gold to buy an island, only to get scammed, and hunt down the Nappa who scammed her, her set trying to be like her role model Pyra, but failing horribly, which leads to some very funny interactions between her and Mifra. Zenobia, where she becomes bored of fighting weak monsters, so the quest is all about killing unique monsters that are part of her affinity chart. The predecessor to Xenoblade 3's Soul Hacker class, which also revolves around killing unique monsters. Cassandra wanted to get some lucky dawn bread, but Cassandra and takes ensue, and bad luck constantly gets in her way. Cora's quest is also pretty good before it became the fuel for Twitter arguments, with Cora and Mifra competing against each other, with the quest ending with Morix holding both of them, which leads into the dance. The entire Praxis and Theory questline, with the climax of Theory killing her own driver, hoping they become sisters again even after Theory returns to her core crystal. These quests were always a delight to do, as it truly felt like I was deepening my bonds with my blades. And yes, even the devil spot. We are Ursula's new groove! And we'll do what we can! At last, we talk about the combat system of Xenoblade 2. The combat system is radically different from previous entries in the series. For starters, you can only auto-attack while standing still, unlike in Xenoblade games before it, where you can move while auto-attacking, which led to setting up positional arts, with movement also being slowed down tremendously. Auto-attacks are now within a three-stage cycle, with each auto-attack getting stronger each stage. The number of arts have been reduced to four, representing each face button on the Joy-Con controller. These all sound like downgrades, in a vacuum, you'd be right, but all these changes play into this combat system's newfound depth. The combat is divided up between the driver and the blade. The driver unleashes the arts, while the blade supplies the driver with benefits throughout the battle. There is a blue line between the blade and the driver called affinity. Think of affinity as the tension mechanic from Xenoblade 1. As your affinity increases, the closer you are to your blade while in combat. As your affinity increases, that blue line will eventually become gold with the driver being granted increased movement and your arts recharging faster. You recharge arts by auto-attacking, unlike the cooldown-based systems of the other games. Using arts boosts the brand new special gauge, unleashing the blade special, which is divided up into four tiers, in which the fourth tier can only be unlocked once you reach max affinity. Canceling your auto-attacks into an art, which can be performed by executing the art as soon as the auto-attack connects, boosts the special gauge even further. You can also execute these specials with your AI-controlled party members using ZO or ZR when they appear on screen. These specials lead into the next mechanic of combat, the blade combo. Blade combos can be performed by doing various blade specials in succession on the right path. Blade combos have multiple paths depending on the elements you use and have various seals upon finishing the blade combos. These seals have multiple effects depending on the path, like sealing away the enemy's abilities called reinforcements or inflicting debuffs like stench. The reaction effects, break and topple, return from the first game and are now accompanied by two brand new reaction effects, launch and smash, to create the driver combo. Driver combos can do some massive damage if the combo is finished, along with dropping HP potions you can collect. Driver combos can be used in tandem with blade combos, 
as the blade combo's timer will be extended if any stage of a driver combo is executed. If you use a driver combo during a blade combo, or vice versa, you'll create a fusion combo. Fusion combos increase the combo's damage and are separated by 7 stages depending on when you initiated the blade and driver combos. For example, a fire fire stage 2 blade combo and a stage 2 driver combo, which would be break and topple, combine into a 4 stage fusion combo. Defeating an enemy with a fusion combo lets you higher XP gains. Also doing a fusion combo lets you this. So good every time. Upon completing a blade combo, an orb of the element that ended the combo will appear above the enemy, which is used for chain attacks. Chain attacks work quite differently compared to their Xenoblade 1 counterparts. Chain attacks in 2 have you executing blade specials to burst down the elemental orbs built up from blade combos. Using the opposing elemental special against an elemental orb does more extra damage to the orb. Once you burst an orb, the meter at the top left fills up and your damage multiplier increases allowing you to have another round to do damage. Each round extension increases the tier of blade special you can use, maxing out at tier 3. Once the meter fills up after bursting enough orbs, you can do a full burst, which increases your damage tenfold, and you perform a level 4 special with the blade that broke the final orb. Executing a fusion combo within a chain attack allows you to retain the fusion combo's damage increases alongside the chain attack. Getting a kill in the chain attack gets you overkill which multiplies the amount of bonus XP gains you get by how much damage you do in the overkill period. This helps incentivize going after high level targets and getting a fuck ton of XP off a chain attack than rather than grinding low level enemies for levels. You can also level up at ends using bonus experience, which alleviates grinding even more. The gameplay loop of building up orbs via blade combos and bursting them within a chain attack doing massive damage are just the fundamentals without mentioning the various blades that give endless team compositions with their unique battle skills. Want a blade that can do insane fusion combo damage? Pick Corset. Need a pocket healer? Ursula got you covered. Want to turn your brain off and spam arts? Use any of the blades who have crit recharge arts or skills. The blades create a system where you can have any playstyle going into a fight. Other mechanics like pouch items that provide various effects like passive or recharge Driver and Blade Affinity Charts, Accessories, Core Chips, and Ox Cores give a lot of depth to this already deep combat system. I still have you mentioned tech like Stutter Stepping, which is performed by moving the left stick in any direction as soon as the auto attack connects. It cancels the animation, allowing you to auto attack again, allowing you to get arts faster than the intended 3 stage auto attack cycle. You only start with one blade and no access to chain attacks, so combat is limited for a few hours. But, once you reach the end game and have access to 3 blades and fully understand the combat, it's always so satisfying to see a super boss's health bar be shredded from a fusion combo or a full burst. But, a combat system isn't reaching its full potential if the enemies aren't up to snuff. And I can say, Xenoblade 2 doesn't disappoint. The enemies you'll find in Xenoblade 2 come in various shapes and sizes, from Gogols, Brogs, and Blants. Just to name a few. The creature design has always been a favorite of mine regarding the Xenoblade series, with each entry bringing its own unique beasts to the table. While exploring the world, you can find the run of the mill enemy that you can battle within the wild, and you can find the returning unique monsters that have gotten a big quality of life change. Previously in Xenoblade 1, once a unique monster was defeated, you'd have to wait for the monster to respawn. But in Xenoblade 2, unique monsters drop a tombstone to allow you to rematch them at any time. A quality of life change that I wish was in Xenoblade Definitive Edition and was improved upon in Xenoblade 3. Monsters can inflict the reaction effects like in previous games, but now specific attacks have a reaction effect drawback, so you can counterattack with the correct reaction effect within the combo to start or finish your own driver combo. It's a cool detail I've always liked about the enemies in this game, and it's a feature that hasn't been brought back since. Too bad Xenoblade 2 does a poor job of explaining the game to the player. I'm not going to beat a dead horse here. The tutorials for this game are infamous for being awful and committing a cardinal sin, not being able to revisit those tutorials. This one reason alone is why Xenoblade 2 is a huge barrier for newcomers and hard for fans to recommend. If I have to give someone Annals Guide on Xenoblade 2's combat, then you know you did something wrong. Compared to Xenoblade 1's beginner friendly and simple combat, Xenoblade 2 is a tough hill to climb, but once you climb it, you get a combat system that hasn't been matched since. Before I get into the nitty gritty of my thoughts on Xenoblade 2's story, I want to highlight our main party throughout the adventure, 
Xenoblade 2's main party is still my favorite, with Xenoblade 3 being a close second. Each party member, whether that be the drivers or their Blade of Companions, are unique with lovable personalities. Well, this one depends on who you talk to. And all of them bounce off each other beautifully, whether that be Nia's sassiness or Zeke's introduction scenes during chapters 3 and 4, and having the mannerisms of a Hanna-Barbera character that never fails to leave a smile on my face. Pandora <laughs> also has some great moments as well, along with Zeke's Blade Ear reveal. Morag and Bridget are badass, with Morag feeling like the mom of the group, along with having some of my favorite heart to hearts in the game. Even Tora and Poppy are great companions throughout the adventure, with the latter supplying one of the most gut wrenching scenes in the game. I haven't even mentioned the incredible voice cast that brings life to these characters. One of my favorite aspects of the Xenoblade series is the use of the UK based talent for the voices. Each nation is represented by the various regions within the UK. Examples like Moradain, were voiced by those who originated from Scotland, and Gormont, voiced by Welsh talent. I love Owl Weaver's performance as Rex, screams and all, with him stepping up the plate in the later chapters. Byra! Byra! Sky Bennett does an incredible job nailing the emotional conflict of Pyra Mifra. Sometimes. I wondered why I have to keep on living forever. Just on and on, no end in sight. But it's different now. Catherine My Hughes' performance as Nia is also one of my favorites, providing some of the funniest lines in the game and perfectly nailing the emotional moments. Hurts, yeah? But that pain's nothing compared to what Pyra must be feeling right now. She went with those bastards knowing full well how much you would hurt. For our sake, not us. I get it, I know. I can go on and on about the vocal performances in this game, but it isn't perfect. The English dub suffers from what I call SA2 syndrome, where the lip sync is synced to the original Japanese audio and doesn't really fit well with the English voice. Behold the mighty Zeke Von Gembu, bringer of chaos! Mostly known as Zeke, and often addressed as the Zekenator! Why no now? Zeke! B! Ultimate! Gem! Kyokto-kaite Ultimate to yomu! Arusto Saikyo no Doraibaya! This leads to strange pauses in some cutscenes, which can sometimes take me out of the moment. As mentioned before, the voice direction can be a little... Ah! But it really picks up in the later chapters. Another problem with the voices... is... Not being able to hear them in cutscenes from time to time. The sound mixing isn't the best in some cutscenes, with the music drowning out the characters' voices, which makes me wish that this game had a little bit more time to cook in the oven. What? I can't fucking hear you! In contrast to Xenoblade 1's more plot-focused narrative, Xenoblade 2 is more character-driven, as each party member goes through their various character arcs throughout the game. Some characters grow more than others. The character arcs tend to follow the theme of finding one's place in this world, with notable highlights being Nia, Rex, and lastly, Pyra and Mephra. The various heart to hearts scattered around the world highlight the beautiful character interactions the cast have with each other. It really sells that big happy family feeling the main cast has. Well, not all of them can be winners. But all joking aside, these moments combined with the impactful moments within the main story make this main party my favorite. Before we move on with the story, I'll take a moment to talk about this laugh. Tora is definitely the fella of all time. His story of not being able to resonate with core crystals, which leads him to creating a blade of his own, is really cool. Tora provides some very good comedy here and there throughout the game, and has some very good developments in Chapter 4, while also providing some good memes within the community, speech bubbles and all. But unfortunately, he carries a quite a dark subcontext with him. Tor creating a blade that has the initial looks of a child, <laughs> or tail waggle mode, and has a closet full of maid dresses is a little suspect, don't you think? 
some of the heart to hearts with Tor just kind of highlight the kind of creepy she's into. It just puts a blight on his character. I love Tor, but these slight aspects just make it really hard to do sometimes. All right, on to the story. Xenoblade 2 starts off as a lighthearted adventure within a world of decay, as the landmasses of humanity, the Titans, are dying out. As seen within the game's first two cutscenes, introducing us to Rex, our protagonist. As the world is slowly dying around him, he thinks about the way to save everyone. To reach the fabled paradise that exists at the top of the world tree, Elysium, as it's stated to have enough land and resources for everyone within all rest, and is the home of their creator, the architect. After a recent job awarded him a temporary death, he gained the first evidence of the existence of this fabled paradise through his meeting with the Aegis Pyra. Rex is now allowed to turn that dream into reality by taking Pyra to Elysium, as this kicks off the game's main plot. Throughout the game, you get constant reminders of the sad state Ulrus is in, with Moira Dane having to colonize other titans like Gormot due to not only for agricultural needs, but also as the death of their titan draws near. The constant wars of Arai also give the feeling that the world can implode on itself in any second. In this fleeting world, people kill. Betray, hunt, loot, all for selfish gain. Not to mention the treatment of the blades, where are used as weapons of war or even inferred to be used for sex trafficking. They sell them. Line up the cords with pretty pictures of the blade inside. It's the same as it ever was. All these points show that Ulrest is a miserable hellhole with an expiration date looming on the horizon. Various members of the main party get affected by the state of the world, with Nia getting outcasted by society for being a flesh eater because their driver wanted to preserve the memory of his daughter, leading her to hide her true self, Tor losing a family member, shut up, and losing contact with his father for several years, Zeke living a lie throughout his whole life, and Morag serves in the line of duty due to a lack of purpose in life. But within this dreary and disgusting world lies a spark of hope, and Rex is the personification of that hope. Despite how the world has treated him, having both parents die at a young age, he is an optimistic person in a world of pessimism. Everything he sees about the state of Ulrus is in just reaffirms his goal to head to Elysium. Rex is a positive beacon for those around him, with a major example being the various members of the main party. After so many years of feeling like an outcast and being on the run, Mia finally found where she belonged and can finally be free, thanks to Rex accepting her. Love him or hate him, don't know if this community can decide or not, but Tora seeing Rex as his role model and fuel for his drive to become a better driver with Poppy is quite admirable. Morag regains that adventurous side of her that she casted away years ago due to Rex in his pursuit of Elysium. Zeke gets to travel with the blade of the legendary hero Adam and learn from the Aegis' driver while on his exile away from home, as he isn't bounded by the lie of his family. But the one that shows Rex's impact on them the most is Pyra and Mephra. Unlike Rex, who aims to reach the fabled paradise so that everyone can be saved from the fate of the Titans, Pyra and Mephra's end goal of reaching Elysium is to die, as that's the way she feels she can repent for what she's done. 500 years ago, during the Aegis War and her fight against Malos, in a moment of rage, Bifur inadvertently sank the Torn Titan to the Cloud Sea's bed. This action led her to mentally break down and create an alternate personality, leaving all the personality traits she despised and filling those holes with insecurities, creating Pyra. Pyra has a sweet personality who can cook, which contrasts Mifra half a millennia ago. She self loathes herself and thinks she doesn't have a reason to live, and who can blame her? She believes that she's a dangerous weapon, and her actions at the end of Torna prove that. The game foreshadows Pyra and Mephra's suicidal nature through various cutscenes. My favorite cutscenes that foreshadow this has to be the ones in Chapter 5, where a conversation with Corrine and Fonset, and her conversation with Bridget and Indol. But with me here, he'll suffer even more, lose even more. So maybe, maybe Rex is better off without me. Rex, and the whole world. They don't need me. Rex first uses the Aegis' power to reach Elysium on his own terms, and with his goals in mind. He cared for them, of course, but he never really understood Pyra and his reasons or feelings. Rex felt like he was invincible and could get through anything with Pyra, but he would get knocked down by the reality of the world. Every time he gets knocked down throughout the story by the hardships of truth, he keeps getting back up because of his promise to take Pyra to Elysium, and that everything will be alright. This mentality caught up with him at the end of Chapter 6, with Jin defeating the party and Pyra sacrificing herself to Torna, saving the party and most importantly, Rex. 
shattering the resolve he had for the first six chapters of the game. Uh, you awakened the Aegis. I thought you might have been different. But you're just... a fool. Uh, a pitiful, childish fool. The beginning of Chapter 7 starts with a defeated Rex, who is ready to give up as the spark begins to extinguish. The other party members bring him back to his senses in one of the greatest scenes in the game. The party took this journey to Elysium because of their bonds with Rex, so seeing the hopeful man that brought them together and made them believe in this tall tale of a paradise, being at his lowest is soul crushing. Nia and Bridget vent at him with anger, and Poppy comforts Rex to remind him about his bonds within the party, and without him, the party's aimless. The rest of the chapter continues to spear Chris Belvis, where the party encounters the tomb which had resides the third Aegis sword and the ghostly phantasms of the great hero Adam. Upon reaching the sword, Rex gets transported to the Elysium simulation from the beginning of the game, with Adam lying at the top. In this conversation with Adam, Adam says that he was afraid to accept the powers and fears Pyramithra had, but Rex is different. Rex learns of the power to accept Pyramithra for who she is and become her true driver, leading into one of the greatest cutscenes in all of Xenoblade. Please listen to what we have to say. Our power has done nothing but bring you pain. It would be better if such a power didn't exist. We told you we wanted to go to Elysium, but the reason why we wanted to go there was to beg our father to let us die. So forget us, Rex. For the sake of the world, abandon us! Abandon you? When you are injured, I feel your pain. When you feel pain, I feel the sorrow in your heart. What the hell? Has he finally cracked? You really think I can just stand by like this? And watch someone I love suffer? You can make it to Elysium. You can make it, with or without us, so please. What would be the point of that? Listen, I swore to you, we're going to Elysium together. That's a promise. I'm going to Elysium for you. I'm doing all of this for you. We'll do it together. We'll find out together. We'll find your place in this world. Find out where we're headed and see what our future holds. So believe me, I won't let the world burn a second time. So, Pyro, Mitra, join me! The end of Chapter 7 truly shows the development between Rex and the Aegis sisters, with Rex accepting her flaws and fears and reaffirming his promise to her along with changing its goal from going to Elysium solely to save Ulrus from the fate of the Titans, to also helping Pyra and Mifra find a purpose in life, most importantly, hope. Not only does this culminate in one of the greatest cutscenes in the game, but also one of the coolest in-game power-ups in the series. I especially love Numa's line, Worry not, all is well. I am lost no longer. It really cements the development of Pyra and Mifra, having them overcoming their traumas with the driver they loved. Xenoblade 2 is a story about hope and change in a stagnant world. Some use that hope to make a difference, while others lose their way and succumb to the realities of life. But when the going gets tough, keep your chin up, because despite humans can be the most malicious beings imaginable, there's always some of a spark of hope attempting to make a change in the world we live. Rex is the beacon of light for not only the main party, but for all the rest, due to his bonds with Pyra, Mifra, and his friends. But what do you get when you get someone who doesn't have that hope or purpose? You get Jin. Jin, 500 years before the main game's events, was a kind soul who wanted to protect his driver, Laura, who had the same hopeful drive as Rex in the main game, but that was snatched away from him by the cruelty of the world in one of the most gut-wrenching scenes. Once the driver dies, the blade is returned to their core crystal, with their memories wiped. A cruel fate for one who just wanted to spend time with the one he treasured most. Jin is angry at the world. More importantly, the architect. 
His one purpose in life was snatched away from him, and now he's drifting aimlessly until he meets Malos. Malos is similar to Jin, even though he caused much despair and destruction to the people of Alrest, but that's all he knows what to do. Blades take the imprints of their drivers, but they're really just computer cords at the end of the day. Malos' driver, Amalthus, was mistreated by the world, like how his mother was killed, and the ones he would end up saving would just end up murdering others. He ended up despising the world and humans because of it. He wanted to destroy, and luckily for him, he got one of the strongest weapons in the world from climbing the world tree. During the Aegis War, he didn't care about anything except for the destruction of the world. But throughout the main game, Miles searches about what he is and questions if his lust for destruction is his own or just an imprint of Amalthus' rage. His yearning for destruction was initially a construct of Amalthus' despair, but later got influenced by the tragedy of Jin. He didn't even want to live anymore. And despite that, his life was the one thing he hadn't lost. Because he couldn't! It all culminated in this incredible scene before the final fight, where he accepts that he too is a wretched being within this world. A scene that is supported by David Menken's astonishing performance. Exactly it! You've gotten smarter with age, huh? I'm a wretched being too. A hideous monster, far beyond saving! So... Thanks to Malos, Jin found a new purpose after Laura's death. Even though that new purpose led him to murdering many people, in Chapter 5, Jin gave the question, Why are you the masters and we the slaves? It is we who embody the very nature of this world. He sees that blades are beneath the humans of all us, and the cruelties of perpetual life lead him towards his anger and yearning for destruction of the world and the architect. Laura's death still keeps him chained down to this world, just like Malos with the imprints of his driver. Their common goal of destroying the world leads them to having a bond. Jin found someone who gave him a path, and Malos gained someone he truly cared about. Upon meeting Rex, a person who had the same hopes as his driver, he starts to change. At the end of chapter 6, Jin thought Rex was a childish fool for wielding the Aegis' power. Another person attempted to play hero with a dangerous power he couldn't possibly understand. But within their clash in chapter 9, Rex tells him that blades and humans are one and the same and believes he has the answer to why the Architect created the Blades. That's right! When a person dies, that's it for them! But their thoughts and memories will always be passed on to someone else! Isn't that the same with you, Blades? Your past selves get passed down to someone else to become your new selves? Isn't that how you've always lived? We're no different! Which leads to Jin feeling that his purpose has been fulfilled. In this moment, a kind and gentle Jin from 500 years ago, who stayed by Laura's side, returned. Jin puts away his malice and regains the hope he had at the end of Sorna, finally putting the end to the man who ruined his life as he put his hopes onto the ones who have a drive for change, Rex and the party splendid soul he was. My favorite interaction with Jin has to go to his conversation with Nia in Chapter 9. Jin, why didn't you kill me when I joined Rex and the others? It wasn't a mistake, was it? Becoming the blade of someone you trust. Jin. I did that too. God, I fucking love this game. Torna, the group, not the country, are just a bunch of outcasts who don't have a purpose, just like Jin and Malos. While overall Torna are good antagonists for the story, you know, our customer trunk are kinda... Eh... And Mikhail gets better once you experience Torna, but Jin and Malos easily steal the show. The remnants of Torna in Chapter 8, in the land of Mortha, show the dark turn where the world is heading. Malthus created a cycle that increased the resonation rate of a core crystal, but in tandem, messes with the natural cycle of the blade, hence them never turning into titans. Amalthus, albeit slowly, was destroying the world as Amalthus thought he was the messenger of the architect's divine will for perpetual bloodlust and hatred. Hence why he sent an attack on the survivors of Torna. Hence why he takes control of the titans, because he believed it was in his right to be the messenger of the architect's will, whether that will was right or not. 
He masked his own actions under the guise of the architect's will, but in the end, he too was human. His acts of getting back at the world led to more bloodshed and tragedy. But, you can really sympathize with him in the end. My favorite scene with Amaltus has to go to the last scene in Chapter 9, with Zeke's monologue. Shows he still had a bit of humanity left within him. Well, in that case, why bother protecting me? Why not let people do whatever? To remind myself, I must never forget what kind of beings humans are. Is that what helping me was, too? Hmm. A long time ago, I seem to recall seeing a very similar scene. Perhaps that too was one face of humanity. Why did you look so sad like that? That was you too, wasn't it? I can talk about this game's story and characters on and on. But this video will be at the 20 hour mark. So let's wrap things up one final section of the narrative. The way I see it, I feel as though Xenoblade 1 and 2 are connected and linked in the sense that they're linear and story-driven games, whereas Xenoblade Chronicles X was more focused on open world and exploration, and maybe an online aspect. I feel like I'd like to continue to create games separating those two aspects out. The World Tree is our end goal for our journey. Similar how the Mechanus was for the first half of Xenoblade 1. In almost every location, you can see the world tree towering over the blue skies of all rest. The reveal that it is a space elevator that's just overgrown with foliage is fucking amazing. The land of Martha and the world tree does a really good job catching you off guard from the switch from the fantasy aesthetic to pure sci-fi for the rest of the game. This game's greatest achievement is the use of the experiment in Klaus from Xenoblade 1. Prior to the release of Xenoblade 2, in various interviews, Takashi stated, Xenoblade 2 is a standalone adventure, and the 2 in the title is to signify the second story-focused title. But I can only imagine the sheer excitement Xenoblade 1 fans got when Rex saw that vision back in Chapter 7, as Xenoblade 2 was my first Xenoblade experience. But seeing the Chapter 10 cutscene for the first time was mind-blowing, with all the new lore given to the player in this, in this one scene. Who are the Savior Art Rebels? What is the Beanstalk? The conduit? It's just, it was all flowing in my mind. And it's always an experience that I would kill to relive. But the experiment reveal also put the Xenoblade series in a unique position. Any order can start from any entry from the Xenoblade series. Play them in any order. As the games are standalone adventures throughout 90% of the game, with elements that link them in the last 10%. You can play Xenoblade 2 and then play Xenoblade 1 and still be surprised by its connections to the other games. A tradition that still goes on to this day. The Architect's reveal as Klaus was also a brilliant move, as before this point, Xenoblade fans only knew Klaus as Zanza, so it's great to see another side of a character we've known since 2010. Klaus lost faith in humanity and became obsessed with the conduit in hopes it saved them and conducted the experiment. But unlike his Eric counterpart in the first game, who saw the benefits of the experiment, Klaus was regretful of the experiment, and decided to not only rebuild his home via the nanomachines within the Cloud Sea, but also create the new building blocks of life, the Blades and the Titans. Along with giving tasks to monitor the new life to the Trinity Processor Corps, Logos, Ontos, and Numa, who are the Aegises and Alvis respectively. But his efforts were for naught, as he foresaw humanity going down the path his world did pre-experiment. But just like the main party, the one who gave the creator hope was Rex and his bonds with Pyra and Mifra. The constant theme of Rex being that guiding light for those who feel nihilistic in this world is heavily apparent through not only the main party, but for the villains in Klaus as well. Klaus's death and Nakano's departure being imminent due to Shulk and the others heading towards Zanza on Prison Island is such a cool way to do a sequel. As Shulk and the others are seizing their destinies, Rex and Co are fighting toward a way forward within the world. But now, Backtracking a little bit to the beginning of chapter 10, we learn that the paradise that the party has been fighting tooth and nail for is a desolate wasteland with one of the most somber themes playing in the background. This trope has been done in various mediums, of course, but the remnants of Elysium is also another reminder of the path Ulrus is heading. Humanity 
leading itself to ruin. The next set of cutscenes show the deepest fears that were rooted within the party, culminating in the dinner for three cutscene. As the previous cutscenes with Nia, Morag, Zeke, and Tora illustrate the flaws in Rex. The greedy man who takes too much upon himself. They show an alternate future where Rex can't save anyone, so he's confused and directionless. He knows something is wrong, but he's powerless to stop it. All he can do is sit there and weep. Well, time to take the opportunity to talk about Rex himself a bit. There have been countless takes about how he barely changed throughout the game, and he's a bad character for it. Rex goes through a subtle character arc throughout the game, and he's not the same Rex from Chapter 1. A quote from Van Damme really struck me. Just go, Rex! Remember to fight your war! And it sums up Rex's arc throughout the game to a T. Rex, to his core, is a man with an optimistic worldview and a childish dream. To save everyone and find a way to make everyone happy. It's a greedy and naive dream for one to have, especially for one person to achieve. Even Adam says it's greedy back in Chapter 7. This dream of his gets him in danger or even on the brink of death on multiple occasions. He didn't take advantage of Van Damme's sacrifice because of this dream and nearly got killed by Malice because of it. It took the cost of Pyra unlocking the power inside of herself that she wanted to keep buried away to keep Rex alive. Even though Rex is aware of his mistakes, he still blames himself. In Chapter 5, even though no one could have prevented Hayes' death, he still blames himself for not being able to save her. After his defeat the Jin and losing Pyra in Chapter 6, he gives up on the spot to the point he was going to abandon everyone, belittling himself but is stopped by the party bringing him back on his feet. The aforementioned simulation cutscenes in Chapter 10 already show the flaws in Rex's ideology. After reaching and realizing that the fabled paradise was just a wasteland, all the fears about Elysium came into the limelight. But unlike Chapter 6, Rex stays true to himself, with no example being better than his talk with Malice in the final fight. Don't you just let it go? Who do you think you're doing this for? I'm doing it for myself. If it helps put smiles on people's faces, helps them live their lives together, then that's my role in this world. Rex finally found it. His war. He's fighting Malos for the sake of others and for himself. The final way forward. This scene encapsulates so many of the game's themes all at once, I could cry. Rex's development culminates in my favorite scene in the entire game, the bridge. Once the party reaches the escape pods, the sudden realization of what's happening came to Rex. He does everything he can to try and cross and get to Numa, but to no avail. Then he goes to this final option he has left, Poppy. Poppy starts out as his comic relief duo to Tora as an artificial blade, but grows to have more human emotion after chapter 4. Her development throughout the game leads to some of the best character moments, like comforting Rex and getting him back on his feet in Chapter 7, and her conversation with Mifra in the Land of Mortha, with Poppy being worried one day that she destroyed the world and it ending up like Mortha, with Mifra comforting her, saying that she'd never do something like that. This leads into the problems that they had, with Mifra thinking it through till the time is right. Fast forward back to the bridge, the promise leads to this incredible moment. Poppy? It not okay. Huh. Poppy cannot. What do you mean you can't? Poppy made promise. I would say that Rex for sure asked Poppy. Say not help Rex, no matter what. Despite that, Rex kept begging Poppy to the point she starts crying. Rex breaks down in a range of outbursts. He didn't want to lose the one he cared for most, despite this being the one thing only Numa could do. But through the party, he finally comes to terms with the situation and accepts their decision. He emerges as a different man than he was a mere moment ago. Rex went from an idealistic kid who wanted to reach paradise, save everyone, to a man who can accept the sacrifices of a loved one for the greater good. The story of Xenoblade 2 is a tale I'll never forget. The story is very slow in its first third, which can throw people off. The comedy can be, eh, and many have problems with Chapter Four. But once you get past those initial hurdles, you're in for an emotional roller coaster. By the time I got to the end of Chapter Three, I knew this game was special. Xenoblade Two helped guide me through a dark time in my life, and every time I replay it, I find something new every playthrough. 
The characters are amazing and left me bawling my eyes out once I reached the Monolith logo. Xenoblade 2 showed me that there's still hope in this world, and our place is closer than we realize. Music can enhance any piece of media, which also applies to video games. Xenoblade 2 excels at this beautifully, as it has some of my favorite pieces of music in any video game. Xenoblade 2's OST was in by Ace, the duo comprised of Tomori Kuro and Horio Yamanaka, Kenji Hiramatsu, Anami Kiyoda, and lastly, Yatsunori Mitsuda. Mitsuda considers Xenoblade 2 the largest project he's ever worked on, and it shows through the compositions the music team did for the game. Hiramatsu mostly composed the battle themes with drum beats, electric guitars, and bass to keep up with the high paced action of Xenoblade 2's combat. Hiramatsu also composed some of the field themes, like the beautiful Uriah theme that gives me the feeling of going on a grand adventure. Or more a dance bombastic theme that shows the pride of the Empire also being a banging tune throughout. Kyoto did some area and story themes, like the ancient vessel, which gives a mysterious atmosphere to the sunken torrent ship that kept Pyre hidden. It's a shame we only hear this track only on the ancient ship. Ace did many field themes, with personal favorites being Lathiria's theme of a calm and peaceful archipelago. Tantal's absolute banger of a snow area. There were a few notable exceptions, with Ace doing the boss theme, Incoming, a track filled with pure adrenaline, with the use of electric guitars and violins, to illustrate facing an insurmountable enemy. Another is Drifting Soul, a vocal track composed by Ace performed by Jennifer Bird of Tomorrow Bird, which encapsulates the story's many themes and can be applied to various characters throughout. So tell me why I'm here and what's the reason I am here today If I recall it was you You wish that I would stay No matter how much wind will blow against me I will keep on Drifting Soul literally becomes Nia's theme in Xenoblade 3, 
which makes sense, as Drifting Soul has been synonymous with her in Xenoblade 2. It wouldn't be a Xenoblade 2 video without mentioning Counter-Attack, composed by Hiramatsu. Counter-Attack is a Xenoblade 2 when engage the enemy was the Xenoblade 1. But instead of a sorrowful tune, with a choir leading into a hype and hopeful chorus, Counter-Attack is just pure action through and through. When Counter-Attack plays in any cutscene, pure hype flows through my veins, as I know the party's gonna turn the fight around. Now, it's time to talk about Yasunori Mitsuda and his compositions for Xenoblade 2. Mitsuda composed the title theme and the majority of the story themes. Mitsuda collaborated with the Bratislava Symphony Choir and Anuna, an Irish Chamber Choir, to produce Theosaur's day and night themes, with its night theme, Shadow of the Lowlands, being my favorite between the two. Mitsuda also composed Jin's battle theme, The Power of Jin, which shows the despair of a man with nothing left to lose. Mitsuda's most notable tracks throughout the game has to go to The Decision and The Tomorrow With You. The decision plays multiple times throughout the game, with the most notable moments being the taking of Pyre in Chapter 6, and of course, Chapter 10's opening, where Klaus begins the experiment. gives me goosebumps every time I listen to this track. But his best track, hands down, has to go to The Tomorrow With You is the amalgamation of Rex and Pyramephra's relationship throughout the game, with the use of the Elysium motif found in tracks like Elysium and the Blue Sky and Where We Used To Be, it is used in the key moments for these characters, like Rex accepting the fears and flaws of the girl he loves and giving her a new purpose, or Numa reminiscing about her memories with Rex. One last highlight has to go to the ending vocal song, One Last You, which is Pyra begging God for one more chance to spend time with Rex. The music of Xenoblade 2 easily knows what emotions you should be having throughout a scene and enhances it. Would Rex's plea to Pyra and Mifra on the Cliffs of Martha be the same without Mitsuda's beautiful compositions? Would Roaming the World be the same without Aces and Hiramatsu's contributions? Just like the story and gameplay, the music is a key part of Xenoblade's identity, allowing it to reach further heights. Xenoblade 2 launched in kind of a rough state, but it got better over time. We received 49 brand new side quests and 14 brand new blades, with 8 of those 14 being completely free. Monolith added Xenoblade 2's new game plus feature, which added new affinity trees for the drivers, including a broken ability for Zeke, level down to inns, turning bonus XP into currency for various vendors for rewards, and lastly, 7 rare blades. Those rare blades are the Torna Blades, like Akos, Petroka, and Mikhail, and their blade companions throughout the main game. Xenoblade 2 later added Telos from Xenosaga as another free blade just for completing the game. In late April of 2018, 
The first blade of Xenoblade 2's expansion pass became rolling out. Poppy Buster. Which wasn't the greatest blade in the world, but it was fine. Later in the summer, we got a now staple for the Xenoblade series. The Land of Challenge. Which is a set of challenge battles with various unique conditions, with the award being costumes for the party to wear. Two new blades were added with the Land of Challenge, those being Shulk and Fjord from the original Xenoblade Chronicles. And in July, the second rare blade of the expansion pass, Crescent, was added to the game. Both Crescent and Fjord created quite a power creep situation for the game, and as both were incredibly busted, it made some more lower tier blades irrelevant. In August, Monolith added Elma from Xenoblade X to everyone's shock, and swimsuits for challenge mode, along with the final blade of the expansion pass, Corvin. September would mark the last time Xenoblade 2 would have any MAJOR post-launch content with the release of the Torna expansion. I said MAJOR, as on December 7th, right before the release of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, one of added the censored Mithra design as a costume, which is the one time I've seen the community like the censored design more than the original. Xenoblade 2's legacy lives on in future entries in other games. Xenoblade 2 was the fastest selling entry in the series, only to be beaten by Xenoblade 3 earlier this year. Pyra and Mephra later got added to Smash Ultimate as DLC fighters as part of the second fighter's pass. Xenoblade 2's combat system has been the foundation for future Xenoblade games, such as Torna in 2018 and Xenoblade 3 in 2022. Xenoblade 2's blade quests would later evolve into the hero quest and ascension quests in Xenoblade 3, with those serving as some of the best side content in the series as well. Xenoblade 2 is a monumental game that lives on with a constant fan art and discussion about the story and characters it receives. Even if another five years pass by, I'll still be talking about the boy who met a girl and took her to paradise. Thank you to those who are still watching till the end. This video took a very long time to make, and if you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more content like this. I also have a Discord server where you have fun and do some silly stuff like this. Everyone, get away right now! Fiora, you want more? Fiora! No! I'll kill you! Well, I'll see you all next time.